It's an eternal being. And we are born of his spirit. And we are born as an eternal spirit being after the order of God. Therefore, when we declare, I love you forever, we are acknowledging the eternality of God's presence and our joint union in that. How many of you know that's a profound thought, a profound statement to say, I love you forever because the very love that's in our soul has been poured out, shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We're declaring we love you, Lord, today. We love you for your presence that is always with us. You promised in your word that you would never leave us or forsake us, that you would walk right beside us. Then you caused your word to be born inside of us, and now you are in us, Father. We thank you for walking beside us, for being in us, and we declare with that understanding we love you forever because we are part and parcel of who you are. You made us, we are in you, you are in us. Therefore, we declare we love you forever. Praises be to your name. Someone just take a few moments and love on the Lord today. Love on this presence, love on the infinite spirit that indwells you, that transcends you. Love on the infinite spirit that has given birth to you in this earth. Love on the infinite spirit that is eternal in the heavens and on earth. And with one spirit, let's say, I love you forever. I love you forever. I love you forever. Lord, just the voices say, I love you forever. I love you forever. I love you forever. Lord. love you Lord today we thank you for your spirit today someone just begin to stir up your spirit man and thank him for his presence we thank you for your presence Lord yes we thank you for your spirit Lord yes we ask for your anointing today we ask for your spirit to move today we ask for enlightenment today we ask for revelation today we ask that you would raise us today, that you would stir us today, that you would lift us today into your glory and into your presence. And the people of God shouted, Amen! Amen! Somebody shout, Amen! Amen! Hallelujah! Well, it is a joy to be with you all today at Grace to Glory at Amazing Grace Christian Church, where Dr. Preston Adams is the senior pastor and where I have the great joy and privilege of being lead pastor for Grace to Glory. You know, God's been doing something great with us. How many of you think he's been releasing some potent, rich material? Um, I'm always being more sensitive to the fact that I am a vessel. You know, I'm not an originator of the material that we share. Just like all of us, when we use our gifts, we are vessels. It's, it's almost like being a hose. The hose doesn't take glory because it delivers water to the parched grass. The hose just functions in its purpose, right? So that's all we're doing. We're functioning in our divine purpose. So any divine substance that you receive when you come here, it is of spirit, it is of God, it's not of man, it's not of Jason. It transcends Jason, it transcends you, but yet we get to enjoy it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Today I want us to stay in the same vein that we've been talking about. We've been talking about building our consciousness to a certain level where what is produced in our life experience is in harmony with the good plan of God that he's intended for mankind. How many of you want to walk in the good plan? Yeah, me too. Me too. In fact, that's my heart's cry that I would walk in God's good plan for me. Who wants to walk in a bad, devilish, negative, cursed existence? Nobody wants that when you're aware. Maybe a deranged mindset that is under the influence of demonic forces wants something like that. But no person who is in tune with who they are in God and who God is in them wants a cursed experience. And that's a great way for me to segue into this, to tell you that this ministry exists to awaken. Somebody say awaken. 
to awaken in the individual his consciousness of God. It is also to overrule works of darkness with light. You might say overrule. overrule. Say awaken. awaken. Overrule. And finally, it's to demonstrate the good. Somebody say, demonstrate the good. I mean, there's time we're always producing bad fruit and not knowing that we're the ones producing it. But bless God, we're getting enlightenment today from the word and by the spirit. And so, as you are on your feet, I want you to center your minds and hearts around our foundational text today. And I want everyone in here, if you can, if you would stand, and I want you to stand to alert your mind to what we are going to be releasing. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Are you there? You can use any device you have. Some of you have regular Bibles, Bibles on your phone, on your pad, whatever you have, you may use that. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17 and 18. I'm going to be reading from the Amplified Version. And it says this, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, emancipation from bondage. There's freedom. And all of us, verse 18, as with unveiled face, because we continue to behold in the word of God, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are constantly being transfigured into his very own image in ever-increasing splendor and from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. I want you to go to your seats and say, I am beholding the glory of the Lord, and I am being transformed into his image from glory to glory. I want to talk to you today, if I were to give a simple title to this, I would simply call this, Be It, Hold It. Be It, Hold It. And for some of you who will need more of an explana explanation for that title, I would tell you to call it this, Changing the Picture and Quality of Your Life. How do we change the picture and the quality of our lives. If we are not satisfied with our present level of demonstration or expression, how do we change the condition of our lives? How many know that outward conditions are determined from internal spiritual forces? That everything in the external world of sense is born out of the internal world of spirit and mind and things that are intangible. That is to say, the intangible produces the tangible. A few weeks ago, we were in Hebrews chapter 11, and we were talking about faith. And in verse 3, we had said that by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen, things which are visible, we're not made of things which do appear. That is to say, that what shows up in this earth realm is birthed out of intangible word substance. It is birthed out of thought form. We reviewed, we said how in the beginning, when God created the universe, he released everything through what? The authority of his word. So we know that word releases what we see. The first thing that God released was what? Light be. And when God said light be, it came into being. Everything God declared, he saw. So God said, and then God saw. So you declare, and you see. You do. You really do. And so many times we are unconscious of what we declare. But today I want us to be in Intentional declarers. Intentional declarers. Amen? Changing the picture and quality of your life. If there's a central thought I want you to focus on here, it's this. Whatever you would hold in your hand, you must first behold in your heart. 
whatever you would hold in your outer demonstration experience of life must first be incubated in your heart. We already do that. Those situations that we find ourselves in, whether good or bad, if we trace their origin, we find that in some way, maybe years ago when we forgot, we stirred it in our heart in some way, shape, or form. How did I get my wife? Do you know that before my family and I moved to Indianapolis, Indiana, as a child, I had this something, this some thought that would constantly come into my mind, and I would say, Lord, I thank you for my wife. I just had this, this impulse, and I said, Lord, I thank you for my wife. Didn't know her, didn't know where we were going to move. But look at her. She was working in my spirit before it was demonstrated. And we do those same things all the time. So if we're going to change what our life is producing, we've got to change what's working on the inside. I love this text in the King James Version that we just read as our foundation. It says, but we all with open face, this is 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. What are you beholding? Because whatever you behold, you begin to be transformed into that image. Whatever you spend most of your time beholding, you're going to bring forth in some way, shape, or form. Whatever you predominantly behold, you attract and draw into your experience. What are you beholding? So your life can take on new qualities and infinite possibilities to the extent that you can first behold it in your heart. What good things do you desire to bring forth? Is it greater happiness? Is it deliverance from bondage and addictions? Is it a greater sense of peace and security? Is it a loving family, home environment with people that you like being around? Is it just a sense of serenity? Is it financial freedom? Is it more than enough money where you can go, be, do, have, as you please, and still walk in the will of God for your life? What is it that you desire to demonstrate? Is it the power of God to redeem humanity from cursed symptoms? Whatever it is you desire to demonstrate, start stirring it in your heart. And you know, you come here week after week, and I'm redundant for a purpose. Because how do we learn to be so dense and dull and down and depressed? Through repetition. We're confronted with depressed situations on the outside, and we take on those realities because we're beholding them over and over and over again. We take that on internally and begin to demonstrate it. So I want you to understand today, being qualifies you for holding. Whatever you are, whatever you called yourself, whatever you closely identify with, whatever ideas are comfortable hanging around in your mind, you're identifying yourself with that. Whatever you settle down and live with as your environment and accept and consent to as truth, you are aligning yourself with that reality. You are being that, and you are going to hold it in your outer world of experience. Who are you? What are you beholding? What can you see? These are the questions you have to ask yourself. The environment you're in externally, most of the time, is what we behold. So now you're taking me here to my points. The first thing I want us to talk about here is Number one, you've got to impress your ideal internally. You've got to impress your ideal internally. What is an ideal? Ideal are those things that I just got finished saying. They are you being, you doing, you having the ultimate good that you can imagine for yourself and also what Christ has purchased for you. Let me walk through this again. Remember, we said that when Christ was on the cross, that he hung on the cross, purchased our redemption from sin, our redemption from sickness, from the curse of poverty, from the curse of depression, from every single thing that the enemy has done in the earth to bring forth hellish conditions. 
We said that Christ has redeemed us from the curse in Galatians 3, 13 and 14. And he has given us the blessing of Abraham and he's given us the promise of the Spirit. We said that all these things are available to us in Christ. How many know, though, that just because something is available to us in the spirit realm doesn't mean we automatically take possession of it and walk in it. Something has to happen internally. Something has to take place. And we come to find out that we initiate what happens internally. You know, it's kind of like the person who is waiting on the sidelines of life, waiting for somebody to give them a push in the right direction. I'm waiting for somebody to come along and motivate me and push me into my destiny. Well, that's not their responsibility. Amen, if God sends, if he sends somebody. But that's not their responsibility. It is my responsibility to move in the destiny that I know God has put inside of me. I can't want somebody to just wait on you to see if you can push me in the right direction. If I wait for somebody to push me in the right direction, I may be pushed in an area I don't really want to go and then be upset at where I end up and then start blaming you and you and you when really I can't blame you for pushing me in a direction because I allowed you to steer me there. Yeah, so we've got to impress our ideal internally. That means you've got to define what is your ideal. What does it look like where you are being doing and having the good that God has promised for you and that you desire for yourself. At every stage in life, there is more good to bring forth. At every stage in life, there is more darkness to be cast out with light. So no matter where you are, no matter where you find yourself, whether you're middle-aged, whether you're young, whether you're a senior citizen, You've got immense purpose, immense destiny, and you're supposed to overrule the darkness and demonstrate the good through the kingdom that's working in you. So you've got to impress your ideal internally. Now, how do we do that? Mankind is made up of so much internally. We've talked about the kingdom, that the kingdom of God is within you in Luke 17, 21. Remember that. We said the kingdom of God is within you. It's a divine production center, and it produces in the external world of reality. But now I want us to see if we can look at this in a different way. We're still talking about this power that works in you. James Allen wrote a wonderful poem that I think just pulls this out, and it reads thusly. Mind is the master power. Repeat. Mind is the master power that molds and makes and man is mind, and evermore he takes the tool of thought and shaping what he wills brings forth a thousand joys or a thousand ills. He thinks in secret and it comes to pass. Environment is but his looking glass. Now, we talked about that in the foundational text, that whatever you behold, you draw unto you. So to impress yourself internally, you've got to understand the structure that works in you. So there's the conscious mind, there's the subconscious mind, there is the super conscious mind. What we just talked about with the mind is the master power, it's none other than the mind of Christ. Apostle Adams preached this in the first service, that you've got the mind of Christ, that you ought to walk according to the spiritual nature if you're going to live the kind of life that God has called us to live. It's not that we don't have a natural nature, but the spiritual nature must rule over the natural nature. The spiritual man must be on the horse. You can't have the beast riding the man. The man must ride the beast. Makes sense, yeah. So we have to walk in a realm where the spirit in us is on top not the other way around. So mind is the master power. What mind? The mind of Christ. That is that super conscious mind. So the conscious mind is what? The, it, it, it is what we are aware of, what we pick up with our external senses. The conscious mind is everything that we can perceive with the physical senses. The conscious mind is responsible for programming the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is known as the secret operator. 
It's responsible for drawing and attracting to you experiences, conditions, people, places, events, opportunities. The subconscious mind is that realm of power. It is the realm of power within yourself that draws according to the information that was placed into it from the conscious mind. The conscious mind deposits into the subconscious mind, and the subconscious mind doesn't tell the conscious mind whether it should deposit that or not. What am I saying? I'm saying that whatever the conscious mind accepts as true and believes for itself, it deposits in the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind faithfully demonstrates whatever is deposited into it, just like the soil of the earth. The soil of the earth does not tell an apple seed, I'll produce for you, but tell some other kind of tree that it won't produce for it. No, the soil is going to produce whatever kind of seed you put in it. And so likewise, the subconscious mind reproduces or brings forth or attracts to you whatever you deposit into it. Now, how do we program the subconscious mind? How do we impress our ideal internally? To impress our ideal internally, it is through the medium of belief and feeling and acceptance what you consent to. Do you believe that for the rest of your life you have no hope until you get to glory? Then that is a belief that settles down in the subconscious mind and you draw to you things that confirm that belief. Yeah. If I believe that I can be a parent, let's say I'm struggling with having children, the doctors say, I can't. Now, I'm not saying that if you don't, that there was something wrong with your faith. But what I am saying is that you can impress your subconscious. You can deposit the right thought, the right belief that says it's on its way. There are wonderful offspring that God has ordained for me, and they're on their way at the right time in the most beautiful way. And so descending those thoughts, those beliefs down in there, you begin to shift your point of attraction. You begin to impress something different internally. You know, if you want to impress in your sphere of existence a life, and I'm going to use money, if you want an experience of life where money flows beautifully and where you're not limited to what's presently in the bank balance at the moment, how do we get to that realm? It starts with what are we impressing ourselves with? When I go buy something, do I say, oh, I can't afford that? Or do I say, I'll be back. I'll be back. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What are we saying internally? What are we accepting, consenting to, and believing as true? Because whatever you accept as true, you draw to you. Yeah, so we've got to impress our ideal internally. I love Proverbs 4 and 23. It says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Where do the issues come from? My heart, which is why through wisdom I was instructed to keep my heart, to tend my heart, to cultivate the ground of my heart, to realize that I am not just existing and whatever's happening to me, I'm just a dead dog and I've got to take it. No, I can craftily and masterfully guard and keep my internal realm of thought and belief and engineer it towards the direction that I am demonstrating that which I desire to experience. I don't know about you, but the more we hear these kinds of things, the higher we come up. You know, you can't hear this stuff over and over and over and over again and stay where you are. So we talked about the subconscious is that realm of power. It takes faithfully whatever the conscious mind gives it and reproduces it in the outer world of experience. Now, the conscious mind of man must have a revelation of the superconscious, which is what? Every good thing God wants for you. So when I download from the mind of Christ, from the mind of spirit, and I accept that in my conscious awareness of life, and I begin to see I am a blessed, redeemed, 
man of dominion because that's who Christ has called me. I am made in his righteousness. I am not a sinful being. I am a righteous being after the order of Christ because he has given me his righteousness by faith. Scripture says that he has given you his righteousness. You have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So it's taking this conscious realm of thought, and now I'm going through life, what? As a blessed being. No more is my conscience condemning me. No more is my conscience condemning me where I feel bad, and I don't feel worthy, and I don't feel deserving, and and I have all of these hang-ups because I've accepted something that may not necessarily be for my ultimate good. What ideas have we accepted that we need to uproot? And I'm talking to myself as much as I'm talking to you. Habakkuk 2 and 2, it says, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and engrave it so plainly upon tablets that everyone who passes by may be able to read it. What is being impressed and written in your heart? Is it clear or is it confusing? Do we ask for one thing today and tomorrow we're working against ourselves? Perfect example of that. And I'm going to stay on this because Apostle's been preaching on supernatural provision and no lack, only provision and supernatural breakthroughs. So do you go to your job? Do you work faithfully? and try to make things work for your home, try to make it rain, like they say, and then believe that prosperity is a bad word. Do you go home and say, oh, that's that prosperity thing. Oh, wait a minute. You can't have what you speak against because the next day we'll be crying. Saying, I can't, I can't this, I can't. You can't have what you speak against. So be sure that you're not working against yourself. If in fact you don't believe in prosperity, stay home. Don't go to work. God wants us to have the good, but we can't have the good if we are working against ourselves. We've got to impress the ideal internally. Number two, we've got to form habits that support our ideal. Form habits that support our ideal. When I get up in the morning, I've got a period, you know, <laughs> you know how we go, sometimes we may not, yes, even the pastors may not always feel like praying in the morning. Yes. So I've got certain things that I can do depending upon what's going on with me at the moment. So I program in my phone and I have a meditation. I have words that I have written down through my private time that exemplify my ideal. I have I am statements. I am statements. Or things that accentuate what I desire to see show forth in my life experience. So if I'm not praying through in the power of God one morning, the other thing I'm doing is lying on my back and declaring I am a prosperous man of God. I am a fruitful father. I am a loving husband. I am a wealthy man of purpose. And I incubate right there where I am in that reality. Guess what I'm doing? I'm impressing my ideal internally. I'm letting it settle down. I'm disentangling myself from the circumstances I may temporarily be in. I'm disentangling myself from the situations of life that try to grip my mind where that's all I can see. I'm disentangling myself from all of that trauma and trouble and turmoil. And I'm impressing in my internal environment The good. The good. Form habits. That is a habit. A habit. A habit. What habits 
can you form that will support where you're going? What habits do you have now that you know are not in alignment with what you want to bring forth? Yeah, yeah. So we've got to say, see how we're going to change our habits and make adjustments. We've got to form habits that support our vision, that support our ideal. I love how Matthew 7 and 7 says it so clearly. Jesus said, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. Everyone who knocks the door shall be opened. And some people would say, well, that doesn't sound like that's what I'm really experiencing. But in truth, that is exactly what we experience all the time. Because we're asking when we program ourselves. Whatever we program ourselves with, whatever we allow to descend into that subconscious realm, we're asking for, seeking for, and knocking. And we're going to get a response. I said you're going to get a response. Amen. You're going to get a response. A response in the external world of your environment. Not only that, a response in the way you approach life, a response in the way you feel about yourself, a response in the confidence you go through life with. You know, enough of this going through life down in the dirt and in the mud. It's time to raise up. And how do you raise up? By first depositing the right thing within. And so we see here, oh, I love this. The third thing, die to the former limiting self-image. Third thing we got to do is to die to the former limiting self-image. However you have viewed yourself is what you have brought into the realm of reality. If you're going to bring forth a new wonder, you've got to form a new self-image. And so to die to the old self-image is to disentangle yourself from the realm of problem and solution and struggle and turmoil that we've been in. Self-image, what is it? Self-image is the creative power of God in you to be, to do, to have, whatever is in alignment with your perception of yourself. It's creative power to produce in your life experience, whatever you consent to as true. What do I believe about life? That's what is going to come about. Mm. Numbers 13 and 32 shows this perfectly. The children of Israel were going to possess the promised land, the land that God said was flowing with milk and honey. It was their land of prosperity. It was their land of promise. It was their land where they were possessing what God had ordained for his covenant people. We're his covenant people in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And there is a land that we are to possess. But as they were going in to possess this land, look at what happened. It says in Numbers 13 and 32, and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched, they were using their conscious mind to search, which they had searched, they were looking with their sensory evidence, which they had searched, they were looking at how bad it is going on right now. You, God, God, God's telling me that I'm this, but that's not what I see on the outside. Which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. That's what they're saying. That's not what God called it. What did God call it? God said it was a land flowing with milk and honey. God said it was their promised land that their generations would live off of and enjoy to the fullest. But that's not what they said. No, 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 no. And that's not what we do. God tells us something, and we look at the sensory evidence. But guess what? We weren't the first ones to do that because they did the same thing. And they also said, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Verse 33, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. How other people view you eventually and ultimately will be what you saw in yourself. 
people say about me in a temporary situation, I really don't give much credence to. Doesn't really make me much difference. But what people see when, 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 when I connect with somebody who sees in me what God sees in me, like Apostle Adam, why do you think I'm here? Because I connected with somebody who saw in me what God saw in me and wasn't afraid to affirm, and likewise, I saw in him what God has put in him, and we came together. How many know what great things we could produce in this earth if we saw the good in each other and called it forth and partnered together for something? My God. You know, and that's, that's, that's a lot of our problem. We're, 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 we are insecure and we don't want to affirm the other person. But when you affirm somebody else, don't you know you rise in that affirmation? You know? And I'm a firm believer of this. You do not have to put somebody else down to build yourself up. If you want to build yourself up, and you feel like you want to say something against somebody else, the minute you open your mouth against somebody else, you jack yourself right down. There are multiple people who have lost credibility in my eyes and many others because they have downed somebody else thinking it was making them look good. So use your word to uplift and affirm someone else. Because when you uplift, when you affirm, you're included in that, and you'll look around and you're going to rise. I said you're going to rise. Yeah. Hallelujah. So what are we willing to give up? Can you give up your former identity with its limiting beliefs? Can you give up that belief that says, I'm with The belief that says, I'm without supply. The belief that says, it's limited. Whew. Don't you know? If God has to use a bird to bring you what you require, God is going to get it to you. God's going to get you exactly what you need, when you need it, when you're in perfect alignment. Amen. I'm experiencing this. You're experiencing this. I could go on and tell testimonies, but that's not what I'm going to do. John 12 and 24 says, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just one grain. It never becomes more, but it, but it lives by itself alone. But if it dies, it produces many others and yields a rich harvest. If it dies, it produces many others and yields a rich harvest. You've got to be willing to die to something for your good to resurrect and demonstrate. You've got to be willing to say no to something if you are going to say yes to your ultimate good. Hallelujah. You must die to the former to bring forth the greater. I think about someone, I mean, I could go on and on, but, you know, someone like Martin Luther King Jr., who had a belief system for himself that said he had a dream where people could get along and not have divisions, right, because of their skin color. Well, that was a dream that was impressed internally in his subconscious mind. Now, his particular belief, what he accepted and consented to, was that he would be a sacrifice for it. That was his personal belief. He accepted it. Before he was killed, he said that I've been to the mountaintop, I've seen. And he knew that his physical life experience was coming to an end. Before he demonstrated it, he knew it was going to happen. So what? He was, he, that, those things were impressed. Never heard it like this before, have you? So he brought forth in his experience. Now, he accomplished extreme good. But understand, things don't just happen by chance. These things are impressed. Jesus Christ, it wasn't like, oh, they took my Lord. They killed him, they buried him, and now he's dead. The master of the world, he couldn't even sit. No, 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 no. Jesus programmed the whole thing. 
Jesus was telling us people what before? That these things are going to happen. What you bring forth in your life experience, maybe, maybe you want to live to enjoy your good. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. But whatever you believe, whatever you consent to, whatever you wholeheartedly accept is done unto you. The Apostle Paul had the same thing. The Apostle Paul, how many know that he experienced extreme suffering? Well, in his conscious mind, y'all ready for this? He counted it as a privilege to suffer for Christ. Why? Think about it. Here he was going around killing, persecuting Christians. Killed them. Persecuted them. Beat them. Put them in jail. Caused them to suffer by the masses. And so now that he becomes a Christian, he only thinks, well, my goodness, uh, what I've put other Christians through, surely I can go through. So of course he has said that I counted, uh, I count the sufferings of this present world to be as nothing compared to the glory that shall be revealed. Because in his internal working environment, he could understand that what Christ is in me and through me far outweighs any suffering of this temporary world. Now, you can take that information, and depending on what you do with it, determines what you express. You could say, well, then that means I've got to live a suffering existence. I've got to die. I've got to be burned in oil to go. If I don't die without a catastrophe, then I'm not honoring Christ. You, do you see how far we can take this? And do you see how far we have taken it in some instances? Yeah, yeah. So what you accept and believe as true for you becomes your reality. Now, I want to tell you, praise God, you know, I always feel like this time is just so short. But thank God there's always next week. The fourth thing I want to tell you is that we've got to rise in consciousness to a new life. We've got to rise in consciousness to a new life. That is to say, whatever you desire to bring forth, begin to live it today. Don't wait another day. Begin to live it today. Whatever you want to bring forth, do not wait to bring it forth before you start enjoying it. Enjoy it right where you are as though it is a manifested reality. That is why Jesus released to us in Matthew 11 and 24. He said to us, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. When are we to believe that we receive them? After we have them? No. He said, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them when you pray, and then you shall have them. So what I align myself with in prayer, what am I doing in prayer? I'm aligning myself with the ideal. In prayer, I'm impressing it internally. In prayer, I am dying to the old former self-image. All of these steps are what you do in prayer. This is what you do in meditation. This is what you do day in and day out when you turn things over and over again. This is what's happening. You're impressing something internally. You're going to get a response from the universe. Something's going to come forth from it. And so now we've got to be what? Conscious sowers. We've got to consciously sow into the ground, into the womb of our spirit, the womb of our mind, what we want to bring forth because we're going to get a response. I said those things about suffering so that you will know that God in you reproduces according to your belief system. Your physical body even responds to your beliefs and your thoughts. Scientists have proven it. Scientists have proven that what you release out of your mouth affects the cells of your body. Scientists have proven that when you say certain things, there are certain registers in the brain that fluctuate and change depending upon the emotion that is emitted. Scientists have proven all of this. Scientists have proven that what you say out of your mouth, this is really way over the edge, impacts something on the other side of the world. That the breath as you're talking, as you speak, 
there's something way over on the other side of the world that was shifted because you released a word. It's called the butterfly effect. Look it up. These are things that happen. Mankind is filled with impact and purpose and power. God, wake us up and thank you for the revelation that you've given us. Thank you for the revelation of being conscious co-creators with God in our physical experience of life. My God, well, I'm glad that you came out today. And we're going higher. We're rising. We're rising in consciousness where we are being, doing, and having the good that God has desired and required and provided for us to have. I want to leave you as you rise to your feet and you repeat after me, arise, rise. shine, rise. for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Now we're going to make it first person. Say, I arise, I shine, for my light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon me. The glory of a God-filled experience has risen upon me. The glory of a totally supplied experience has risen upon me. The glory of a peaceful, prosperous experience has risen upon me. The glory of peace and happiness has risen upon me. The glory of vision and purpose has risen upon me. The glory of good health has risen upon me. The glory of happiness has risen upon me. The glory of love and success has risen upon me. The glory of good fortune has risen upon me. The glory of divine power has risen upon me and is expressed through me today and always. And for that, I give thanks. It cannot be otherwise. And I rejoice because of it. And the people of God said, Amen. Put your hands together and just rejoice.